Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get into our Father's Word. Fantastic. You know, today we open where God, speaking to Moses, declared even back in Horeb that he would raise a prophet among his own. That wasn't the first time it was said, though. I want you to know that, it, and it's naturally, it's speaking of Jesus Christ, all right? That God said, he's going to be just like I am, meaning God, Emmanuel, God with us. But the first prophecy of the Bible, basically, which was to say, written in the, this earth age, is where it is written when God spoke to the serpent, that is to say the devil, old Satan, and said concerning the woman's seed, her offspring, of which this prophet would be, he said, I will put enmity between her seed and your seed, and uh, her seed will bruise your head, and you shall bruise his, that is to say her seed's heel, where he was nailed to the cross. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, He foretold of this one and letting you know that the controversy, the main, the real war in God's word is between God and Satan. And actually there lying in between is the deception of the children who will trust our father and who likes to be lied to? Really, if you are not loyal enough to your own father, which he is, to stay with him, then you need to be lied to. So Father telling Moses here in Moses' last 30 days on this earth, in, in flesh, that he would bring forth Messiah, the Messiah, much as Moses was, which is to say the Savior of the children. So with that having been said, let's get pick it up with verse 16. Uh, I will read part of 15 again, where God would say, of thy brethren like unto me, meaning like unto God Almighty, If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Unto him ye shall hearken. You better listen. Why? He was the living word. And let me tell you something. It's real easy to get sidetracked with some other word. And your ears might be tickled by some other word. But God's word is complete. Focus on it. Don't allow something else to pull you off to the side. Satan writes most of the rag sheets that pull people off to the side, incriminating, and many people are not wise enough to know that the Kenites are the author of most of that hate stuff. Simply to pull the good old boys off track. Good old boys had better sharpen up, all right? The real prophet, the living word, told you all you need to know if you could ever absorb it. Most can't, be that as it may. So we, with that prophecy being made, we pick it up in chapter 18, verse 16, and it reads, According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. In other words, God wanted to be that king, their king as he had stipulated in the 15th verse of the the prior chapter. He was sending him a king, all right? It would be Messiah. And they could not tolerate the presence of our Father, his perfection, his might. Verse 17, And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. They, They said it real good. 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, 
like unto thee. Now remember, like unto God and like unto Moses. Now that gives you a pretty good descriptive uh, suggestion. And will put my words, you underline that in your mind and don't you ever forget it, my words in his mouth. Therefore Christ became the living word, the truth, and that that you need to absorb, whereby you have eternal life. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. That's why that his Sermon on the Mount, every motion, every teaching that he held, whereby much of it quoted from the Old Testament or when he was questioned, his answer many times would be, haven't you read? Or it is written, it's written here. And it's for you to absorb, it's the instructions of how you find peace of mind and happiness in your flesh body. Naturally, all these verses pertain to the coming Messiah. Yep, it's in the Old Testament, but it still pertains to Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. Verse 19, and it shall, not maybe, it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, my words put in his mouth, you got it, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Hey, that's just the way it is, friend. Never let anyone sidetrack you with the propaganda put forth by Kenites. You know, Kenites have a real good way of creating slogans among good old boys and their tear sheets, their publications, dreaming up slogans to entrap all of them. Be very careful. There's one word, one name, and one truth. And if you, if you allow someone to pull you away from it, you're hurting a bunch. You've been had. If the enemy can outsmart you, you're pretty easy to outsmart. You know, I'm going to turn over to Hebrews in the New Testament. And I'm going to go to the fourth chapter. And... What, what, what is God's word capable of? All right, that's what I want you to think in mind. And this wonderful, wonderful fourth chapter of Hebrews, which tells you what the true Sabbath is and became. But I want you to concentrate and focus on the word of God, what it can do. You've heard me say it changes lives. And as a teacher of it, I have seen it change people from potheads, druggies, to successful family and businessmen and, and women. The word is powerful, God's word. Hebrews chapter four in the New Testament, the 12th verse, and it reads, for the word of God, I wanna repeat that, for the word of God is quick. That means it lives, it's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. That's what God's word can do. And of the joints and marrow and is a discerner, a judge, one that can judge good from evil, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hey, if your heart and your, um, what, what, what did God say back in the Deuteronomy? And that's why I wanted to go to Hebrews. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. I will discern him. I will discern that he needs to go to hell. It's that simple. God, you know, if, if you place God's word into your mind, which is your spirit, it is your intellect. And if you would let the enemy sever the sharp word of God from your mind, you're an easy mate, friend. You're, you, I mean, you, you will blow around in any old breeze. Read a little something and get all shook up. <laughs> it just tangles me. You better have it be the word of God that sharpens your case. Because nothing, nothing has ever been written 
compared to the Word of God that will prepare you to meet the enemy one-on-one, eye-to-eye, Satan himself. So don't go chasing the tail of the snake or you'll get bit. A word to the wise is sufficient. Verse 20 of the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name. This means claims it's my word. Which I have not commanded him to speak. Or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And there again, back to um, Genesis 15. Chapter 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. And the controversy, the war began. Now, you've heard um, many times, I call it one-upmanship among the so-called brethren, the revs, when they get all revved up. I talked to God this morning. God said to me that I should have maybe vanilla ice cream instead of strawberry today. I was wondering where I'd park my car. God told me where to park my car. Hey, if you're not smart enough to know where to park your car, God won't use you as a preacher. Uh, and, and that goes for congregations or anybody else. If some one-upman wanting you to think he has a close walk with God, I guarantee you God didn't say it. I won't judge him, but I know our Father pretty well, and I know he doesn't have time to to pass the time of day with some yokel that pretends to be a preacher. And I, I know that I'm very direct and I'm, uh, that's why I'm so popular in the religious community. Is truth just can't, they can't hardly stand it, some of them, that is to say those that are plain. God doesn't like it. God does not appreciate his people being misled, and that's why those ministries have to beg on their knees to, to stay before people, because God is not going to bless them. Hey, that's a truth. That's a fact. And there's nothing ever wrong with speaking truth. The word of God is sufficient unto itself. And all you have to watch is some would be be very careful of those that run around saying I talk to God every day every moment they may have prayed but did God hear them when they act that way before a group of people that are lay persons that don't know any better well, I know what God thinks about it even that prophet shall die because you're actually prophesying that God spoke to you and his word is law and the people must follow it. If God didn't say it, I'd hate to be in your shoes. The only reason I'm saying this is because I do care. I may not care as much about you as I care about the people. Don't mislead them. Don't set bad examples in front of them. Don't pass God's messages off as something frivolous. Like where to park your car, what to wear, or something of that nature. Not to say God wouldn't if you wanted to, but um, you see, let me, let me just put it so that, it, so that the lay person understands. What automatically happens to the lay person's mind is they know that God doesn't tell them where to park their car. They know that God doesn't tell them what to wear. They know that God doesn't tell them which ice cream to eat. Therefore, automatically, in their mind, they got to think, a revolving rev is really something. God speaks to him, but he doesn't ever speak to me. Well, I, I, layperson, I got some news for you. That misleads you because he doesn't talk to the other guy either. The other guy is sucking hot air. And, and, and blowing it on you. Am I judging? Nope, not at all. Read your father's word, grow accustomed to it, and you'll know they're lying. All right? Some of them, God may speak to at times, but it's real easy. He tells you how to check it out. Verse 21. 
And if thou shalt say in thine heart, in other, in other words, in your mind, you wonder to yourself, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? How do we know when one of these revolving revs is lying to us? It's real easy. If it isn't written in God's word, and that's why you must be familiar with it, it's a lie. God will never expect you to believe something that isn't written in his word. Verse 22, this is how you tell, he'll continue, listen to your father. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, taking it on himself, I be a man of God, Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Do you know why you don't have to be afraid of him? God's going to destroy him. God's going to crush him. You might say, well, how, how do I know? Have, uh, it would, then you would read closely and not overlook what you were reading, right? The question was, if the thing follow or come not to pass, then which the thing which the Lord hath not spoken... How did God speak? Right here in the Word. This Word speaks. It lives. Do you remember when we were back in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12? Do you think I went there because we had a little time to, to fluff off? No. It said the Word is quick. That means that Word in the Greek should be translated it lives. It's a living thing. It's alive. And when God speaks... You want to hold on to that word. In other words, this word. And if somebody comes along peddling hot ashes, don't worry about it. You don't have to be afraid of them. Don't be intimidated by some crackpot that claims he talks to God every day and all that kind of stuff. That's not prayer. Prayer is when you talk to the Father. But to say that the Father, to leave it seem to the layperson... As though someone is so, such a, re, needs to be reverenced because God speaks to them morning and night, tells them every move to make. Or one of these jokers that'll say, hold, hold it, hold it, oh, oh, God just talked to me. Now, God doesn't really work that way, friend, in the real world. Uh, again, I'm not judging but don't let some show actor, the word hypocrite means a play actor. Don't let some play actor suck you in. And naturally, the play actor, God isn't big enough to support his bankroll, so he's got to beg you. You just got to, I mean, they're going to pass a plate. I, I will never allow one to be passed in a meeting I hold. Do you know that? You know why? I'm not a beggar and God doesn't send out beggars. God will touch the hearts of people if you're teaching truth. And they will support his ministry. Not yours, his ministry. Uh, I wonder how popular this ministry would be if I had called it the Arnold Murray Show. Hmm? The Arnold Murray Hour. Well, it's God's hour. He's the shepherd, and this is Shepherd's Chapel. It's all his. Uh, I would be very, very careful. And again, I'm not branding people, whatever. Hey, whatever they want to do is fine. If they want God's blessings, they'll follow God. If they don't, they'll do what they're doing. It's just, and I, then they have to beg, be that as it may. God promised us from the Old Testament that the Messiah would come. He did. He was just like the God. He was like our Father, Yahweh. So love him, appreciate him, and pray in his name, and protect your credibility spiritually and scholarly by having enough knowledge and wisdom from the word to know when someone's conning you or not. Chapter 19 has to do with civil law. It has to do with murder, manslaughter, accidental deaths, um, landmarks, 
That's to say, deeds to property and so forth. Let's go with it. Chapter 19, verse 1, and it reads, When the Lord thy God hath cut off the nations whose land the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their cities and in their houses. Now, don't overread the fact that God gave it to them. They didn't really conquer it. It was a gift from God. Why? Well, God never takes anything that they don't deserve. So I have, in my own opinion, I know that it goes all the way back to the first earth age of, of ownership. I think it was just return, be that as it may. Verse 2, thou shalt separate the, uh, three cities for thee in the midst of of the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. Now you're going to you're going to uh, run across a little bit of confusion in your mind. They had six cities. They've already established three because they're on the east side of Jordan. Why there will be three more? Those three cities of refuge will be over on the west bank, the west side of Jordan. Okay, that gives six. So. Um, uh, we don't work with, there's, um, and what is the city for? Verse 3, thou shalt prepare thee a way and divide the coast of the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to inherit into three parts and that every slayer may flee thither. Now, what does it mean, slayer? Well, that doesn't mean murder, okay? That's the, why the murder is a key word you must learn. What, cr what creates a murder, all right? Listen carefully, verse 4. And this is the case of the slayer. This, this is going to be an accident. We shall flee thither. You don't just let every slayer run to that town. you got to go by the law. That he may live... Whoso killeth his neighbor ignorantly, in other words, it was an accident, it wasn't premeditated, whom he hated not in time past. Verse 5, as when a man goeth, he gives you an analogy here, an example. As when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor to hew wood, hey, they're good buddies. And his hand fetches the stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slippeth from the heave. The axe flies off the handle, the bit, the blade. And what does it do? It lighteth upon his neighbor that he die. He shall flee unto one of those cities and live. In other words, he did not purposely kill his best friend, his neighbor. Someone he would think enough of to go cut wood with. It was an accident. It just happened. He didn't hate him, had no animosity toward him. That is it's just a, an accidental death. Then God says, let that man flee to that city of refuge. There's a reason for that. Because people are people. And naturally, uh, that good old buddy of his has children and a father probably. Do you know what they're going to think when they find out that their dad or son is killed? Some of them might get a little hot, might want a little revenge. That's why the city was. Verse 6, lest the avenger of the blood pursue the slayer while his heart is hot, while his mind is angry, and overtake him because the way is long and slay him, Whereas he was not worthy of death inasmuch as he hated him not in time past. In other words, you provide the way. You give safe passage to that person. The community should do that. These are very good laws even to this day. And believe it or not, we pretty well um, stick with part of it. Seven. Wherefore, I command thee, saying... Thou shalt separate three cities for thee. You must have these cities where accidental uh, slayers can flee to them, can have uh, refuge there, safety. Eight, 
And if the Lord thy God enlarge thy coast as he hath sworn unto thy fathers and give thee all the land which he promised to give unto the, thy fathers, nine, if thou shalt keep all these commandments to do them which I command thee this day, to love the Lord thy God, to do what? To love the Lord thy God and to walk ever in his ways. Then shalt thou add three cities more for thee beside these three. In other words, the three on the east and the three on the west. God understood the hearts of men. God understands when someone deserves to die and when they don't, whether they planned it or they didn't. And you don't con him. That's why I always say, when approaching the, spirit, the subject of capital punishment, there are no hidden mysteries with God. He knows the truth. First, in, in the first place, the person that was murdered or disappeared, is with, if they are deceased, they're with him telling him everything that happened as though he didn't know already. Verse 10, that innocent blood be not shed in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and so blood be upon thee. He didn't want blood to be upon thee. Blood usually means uh, uh, the guilt of murder. Now, the um, avenger of the blood was your closest relative. And that's the way it was. Numbers 35 gives you, naturally, we're to obey civil law. So in this generation, naturally, we must go by the laws of court. Unfortunately, they're not as fair as this law is, but be that as it may. But the avenger of the blood is a legal term that means the person that is responsible and the nearest of kin. Verse 11, but, this is on the other hand, if, if any man, but if any man hate his neighbor and lie in wait for him and rise up against him and smite him mortally that he die and fleeth into one of these cities, in other words, he tries, to, after committing a murder, premeditating, he runs to one of those cities, then the elders of his city shall send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. That means capital punishment must come forth. In other words, it is a sin worthy of death in the flesh and God demands it. You get a bunch of these revolving revs at some of these penitentiaries when somebody at the hand of two witnesses has been proved as an actual murder and they got, God doesn't like this sort of thing, showing their ignorance. It's sad, it's really sad. Is it any wonder that the world is such a mess when the uh, priesthood itself is biblically illiterate? That is sad, real sad. Verse 13, thine eye shall not pity him. Don't you get on a guilt trip. But thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel that it may go well with thee. In other words, you will show no sympathy and not get on a guilt trip because you have to put a murderer to death. It's required of God. Well, oh, but Jesus said, turn the other cheek. No, that's when you're a disciple out teaching the word and you um, get a little carried away and put too much on one of the revolving revs and he reaches out and smacks you, then turn the other cheek. But if it's a murderer, you kill him. If he, let's say that if a murderer rapes and murders a 12-year-old girl, I guarantee you if we string him up or kill him, it ain't, it's not going to happen again. So don't, only an idiot would say that's not a deterrent. That capital punishment doesn't work. It does. That's it. Fini. Sent to God to face the 12 year old, and boy, is she waiting for him. As it's, uh, um, as it's written in uh, 1 John. Uh, in the New Testament. 
And I can't help turning there. First John in the New Testament. Do you know what the New Testament says concerning murderers? Chapter 3, verse 15. Wherefore, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Why? He's supposed to die. He's got to take it up with the Father. It's not to say he may not repent there. I don't know. No one does. But he's got to end his tour here and go there where the victim is. Now, we're going to go somewhere else. Did Jesus teach capital punishment? Of course he did. And due to the ignorance of some revolving revs, uh, which are unable to handle the manuscripts, I'm being real sweet here, but a true fault, all right? And the truth sometimes hurts the little fellows, but be that as it may, they need it. They got it coming occasionally. I don't like to see people mislead the children of God with false teachings. Chapter 5, the great book of Matthew, Christ's teaching. And you're going to have it on the screen there. We're going to start with verse uh, 17 in chapter 5, the teachings of Jesus. Listen to it. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. That means Deuteronomy, Leviticus, so Ten Commandments, or the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the Twelve. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He fulfilled the prophecy that we read in the closing verses of the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy. God raised that prophet up, Emmanuel, God with us. 18, for verily, this is truly, truly, I say, Unto you till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Well, has heaven passed away? Has, has this earth age passed away? I don't think so. Then God's law is still very much, capital punishment is very much still in effect. Again, next time you see a bunch of these misled, untaught, revolving revs at some penitentiary holding candles, just mark it up, ignorant, ignorant, ignorant. You know, that's not an insult to them. It's a fact. Verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so. You shouldn't, you shouldn't execute a murderer. Well, that's, that's false. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. It may not be popular on earth, but it's very popular in heaven to teach truth. Verse 20, For I say unto you, Christ teaching, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's got to be better than that, or you ain't going to make it. Now, this is why we came here. Pay attention. Verse 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. That's the word is murder. All right, I'll document it here in a moment. And whoever, whoever whosoever shall murder shall be in danger of judgment. They're going to hell. The danger is there that they most likely will not make it. Now, what is this word kill in the Greek manuscript so that you, some one, some revolving rev can't uh, mislead you? Let's call it up on the screen. Fanyo. Its prime is 5406, to be a murderer of, kill, do murder, slay. Now let's go to the prime. This is where, where the truth lies. Fanyance, and it comes from 5408, which gives you a, a murderer always of criminal or at least intentional homicide. In other words, a criminal. Christ said, they're not going to make it to the kingdom. Most likely. So Christ did not teach that capital punishment should not be exercised. He said, I don't change one little jot. Incidentally, do you know what a jot is? Or tittle? It, it is uh, basically a vowel point in the Hebrew manuscripts. 
the smallest, tiniest little letter that, what, so what he's really saying is, I don't even change the sound of one letter, much less the letter of the law. It's pretty absolute, my friend. God's truth is so important in your life. If we followed God's law, discerning and having witnesses beyond any shadow of a doubt, and executing every criminal, death rows would never be full. They would always be empty, and heaven would be having more courts where they don't have lawyers called slick to weasel out of the guilt for God knows. And it doesn't matter how many times they've weaseled out of it or appealed or repealed here on earth, God's still gonna get them anyway. They're gonna die someday and they got it all to go through. There's somebody up there waiting for them. And I wonder, you know, if you murdered someone or if some character raped and murdered, tortured a 12-year-old girl, do you think that girl will have good thoughts of that one? I don't think so. A tooth for a tooth, what does that mean? <laughs> He's gonna suffer a lot more than she did, and they still got it coming. You never get away with anything with our Father. Thank God for that. That is God's Word. It cannot be changed. It is written. Justice will always prevail over men's courts, for there is a higher court, and that higher court is the court of God. Amen. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say, in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. All right, bless your hearts. There we are back again. The 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular revolving rev, a denomination, or an organization. Let's just teach God's word as it's written. It does a real good job of correcting that that is an era, all right? Now, you got a prayer request? Those of you that are listening around the world by short wave, your announcer will give you our mailing address at the end of the hour. And that prayer request, you don't need the telephone number, you don't need an address, talk to him. He is your father. Father, around the globe, we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, let's get into some questions here. We're going to go with Ellie from Georgia. I'm curious to know what you think about Adam and Eve being the first of mankind. Do you, do, do you think there was more than just Adam and Eve? Of course there were. The manuscripts make it very clear, and it's too bad that more scholars don't uh, level on the fact that there is a difference between Adam and Ha-Adam. You know, people, and, and actually, you can pick it up from the English if you stop and think for a moment. You can certainly pick it up if you um, order our tapes, 146, three tapes that cover the creation, because it takes a little help sometimes in the Hebrew, but God, in chapter 1, created the people, all the races. 
That's why we have different races. God created different races. Genetically, it is impossible that all races came from two people. That, that is so easy to document with DNA now that it's, it's um, and of course, well, you don't understand. Uh, science has nothing to do with God's word. Oh, yes, it does. Science and God's word don't differ all that much. It's people's biblical illiteracy that differs with God's word. It stipulates that he created the people. He didn't have, he didn't, uh, he put them over hunting, fishing, and so forth, over the animal kingdom. He rested the seventh day, and then on the eighth day, he realized he didn't have an ha'adam to tend the soil, a farmer. So he created the farmer. Adam, ha'adam. And it, there would be no racial problems if people would study God's word and understand we are different. And to love and respect with dignity the diversity of others. Bonnie from Canada. Where would I find aliens and UFOs mentioned in the Bible? Well, you're not going to find any aliens mentioned in the Bible, uh, as uh, as you mean in modern day English, but you can find uh, flying vehicles in the Book of Ezekiel. They're not un you means unidentified. They're not unidentified. God knows who they are, where they are. His throne, as a matter of fact, was aboard the vehicle that Ezekiel saw. The um, Bonnie. Take chapter 1 of Ezekiel. Take your Strong's Concordance. And along about verse 4, you have the color amber. Check that back to the Hebrew manuscripts in your Strong's Concordance, and you will find it was highly, it appeared to be highly polished bronze. It was a circular vehicle. No great mystery in that. Then, okay, uh, this is from... Um, Michelle from Virginia. Then what do you call the language that people speak in church that everyone else doesn't get any understanding from? Question. It is said that uh, that is the spirit of the Holy Spirit and requires at least two witnesses to interpret the message. No, where it speaks of letting two um not let over two speak in a foreign language without an interpreter. Don't let over two of them speak at one time. First Corinthians 14. The word in the Greek is language. To be very specific, the word in the Greek is to say a language that was not naturally obtained. Meaning you didn't, you were not born where that language was spoken. You had to learn it whereby you could communicate. And naturally, it's just common sense. If you speak, for example, if I speak only English and I go to Ciudad de Mexico to teach God's word where they only understand Spanish, I would have to take a tape, a, 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 a interpreter with me or I'd be nuts, right? Why? The people, they wouldn't even know when, they wouldn't know when to say amen. They wouldn't know what I was saying. I would be wasting my time and theirs. And that's what God is talking about. Now, let's go to the tongue on Pentecost Day. Do you believe God or do you believe man? Man says that I don't know really what he does call it. I know what it sounds like. But the real tongue with the evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> excuse me, you will find written in Acts chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. And I'll tell you what, you were so sincere in your writing. I'm just going to take a minute and we'll turn there so that we've been studying about the Word of God and how perfect it is and how, in, how it lives and how it divides truth from fiction. And if we go to Acts chapter 2 where the Pentecostal tongue was spoken on that Pentecost day, Acts chapter 2, they heard the disciples talking. And what did they say? Listen, 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, 
saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans, aren't they only supposed to speak the tongue of the, of the Galileans? That they speak in Galilee? Eight. And how come it is, how here, we every man in his own tongue, his own language, wherein we were born. They are, they're speaking in the dialect of the county in which I was born. You see, there was nothing unknown about it. Because with the presence of the Holy Spirit, it comes out in, without an interpreter in your own language, even in the county, the dialect, in the county in which you were born. And they continued on. What they marveled at is it was all languages at one time, but the Holy Spirit was able to make each ear hear it in their own tongue. Now, man can't fake that. Man can fake a lot of things. And like I say, it's not hard for me to tell you what it sounds like. But the Pentecostal tongue is a clear, concise language, yours, whatever your nationality is, spoken with the dialect of the county in which you were born. Now, do you believe God's word or do you believe what some revolving rev might say? Now, I, I know I'm just, I, I'm not very popular with some, but they still respect me because I won't back off from teaching God's word as it is written. That's what Jesus would say. It is written. So, Michelle, there you have it. It is written. Except Christ's teachings, not man's. Bill from Oklahoma. Please document that the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is Satan and not Judas. Also, the New Testament says Judas repented himself. Could this possibly be translated it meant that G Judas felt sorry for himself? No. But it can mean when the word hanged in the Greek can mean he died of sorrow, but he didn't. Acts chapter 1, verse 18, the chapter prior to the one we were just reading about tongues, tells you what happened. They cut him open from his Adam's apple to way below his belly button till his entrails fell out on the ground. He, he, he hanged himself all right. They killed him. Why? They couldn't afford to let him live. Now, do you think uh, God would, um, do you know what the word perdition means? It means to perish. Whoever the son of perdition is, he's already went through his great judgment. And it's already demanded by God that he's going to perish. Christ would say in John chapter 17, St. John chapter 17, Father, it is the last time. And it would be one of his last prayers. It's the real Lord's prayer in my book. He said, I have made salvation available to all but the son of perdition. Why? The son of perdition is already, meaning the son and God's son, Satan is one of God's sons, God created his soul, has already been sentenced to perish. He's going to die. Now, God is fair. He hasn't already sentenced Judas to death. And now if you just think about that a minute, you'll know it. Judas still must go through the white throne judgment. <clears throat> and you shouldn't second guess him, our father. So your documentation is to take the word partition, break it back to the Greek, find out the true meaning, and then read Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19 where Almighty God has already sentenced Satan to perish, meaning perdition. So he's the only one. There's no guesses. Patsy from North Carolina. I am a registered nurse and have worked in the emergency rooms in, and in intensive care. I want, want to verify your statement that activity does increase on in these areas during the full moon. Thank you. Well, thank you, Patsy. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that, that holds true of just about any emergency room, police station, or what have you. I mean, the lunar, this is why God would call the demon the lunatic, 
comes from the lunar, the moon. If you think the moon doesn't affect people, you've got another thing coming. Thank you, Patsy. Uh, most any police station or experienced uh, hospital physician or staff nurse would tell you that. Deborah from Arizona. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 through 16 concerning widows and how they should act. I am 42 and my husband has been passed away a year and a half. May I see another man? Well, well of course you can. Now, uh, the really, in Timothy there in the fifth chapter, basically it says, don't go around. <clears throat> it doesn't hurt if you go around young people. You, you uh, say you have a child. Mm -hmm. No, I don't see. Anyway, you don't go around teenagers looking for a man. All right, that's all it's saying. That would that wouldn't be right. But in your own age group or whatever, give or take a little bit. Well, it's fine to go there and look. You're 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 a widow, and um, God intended that we all have a mate if we so chose. All right. Is, as a matter of fact, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it'd be kind of nice if you could stay like I am, but if you, if you um, must marry rather than burn, it doesn't mean burn in hell, it means burn with passion, meaning you need, it, you need a, a mate. All right? He said it's better for you to marry if that be the case. Tom from Louisiana. Why is the beast loosed for a short period at the end of the millennium? To test those that had not an opportunity because God doesn't want anyone in the kingdom that hasn't been tested just like you have been by Satan when you know the truth. Mary from Canada. How come false teachers can do miracles in Jesus' name and a good Christian can't? Well, Mary... It's like um, um, the sky falling and Henny Penny. What was her name? The little chicken? Whatever, you know. A lot of it's fake is what I'm telling you. They don't work miracles. You, you, uh, you know, you can take uh, many times, and I'm not making light of ill people, but out of ill people, you're going to find a percentage that are only hypochondriacs. They, I mean, they, they live and dream sickness. They, they want to be sick. They don't really want to be, but it's, that's the way they get their uh, whatever they get, all right? It's, that's why they're called hypochondriacs. You get a bunch of hypochondriacs in a room, and they, I can have you throwing crutches in 10 dozen different ways, but they're not healed. They're just on a, a gig. And many times, it's like one famous so-called healer. He goes up to one person and grabs a walking cane and throws it and then grabs the man sitting beside him up and runs him up and down. It wasn't even his walking stick, you know. It was, he got the one that, anyway, showmanship, spitting on people's and in their faces and pushing them over and knocking them down. Serving God stands you up. And again, here I go making friends and influencing people. I swan, I tell you, it's awesome. But hey, be mature in God's word, all right? That's what Paul would say in, in that great book of Hebrews, just the next chapter after four and five we were talking about there. You've stayed in milk toast and little syrupy stuff so long You've been a Christian for 30 years, but you need a teacher all over again because you listen to malarkey. It's like re-crucifying God all over, Christ all over again, Paul told them. So it's, it's about time we had a little maturity in the Christian community whereby sane people would be willing to join a church with sanity rather than a bunch of stuff that's put out, warmed over, left over, trodden down, reused, revamped until it's um, not very palatable. God's word demands that you protect your credibility instead of looking. Bertha from Texas, what does the Bible say about lazy people? Well, it says if they won't work, they shouldn't eat. Don't feed them. And pretty soon they get over their lazy spell. All right. 
uh, Hebrews, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 says, If a man won't work, then he shouldn't eat. The great book of Proverbs says that a lazy person, this is what God thinks about him. He says, as a set of hinges are to a door, a lazy person is to the mattress. All, all he does is he just turns from side to side. And that's all he's fit for is being a hinge to roll himself. God doesn't like lazy people. Joanne from, I don't know where Joanne's from, do I need to get baptized? Well, Christ was our example, and I would ask you, was Christ baptized? Yes, he was. Well, are you better than Christ? Of course you're not. So you should follow his footsteps. Why? Because it pub you are making a public statement to him that you do believe that he died, that he went into the grave, the water, and that he resurrected and, um, and into a new life, pre preparing a new life for us. That's what it's about. It's between you and he. Hi, Harold from North Carolina. Where can I find out about the Kenites? Well, I have a tape titled Kenites, or you can ask your nearest revolving rev about the Kenites, and he probably will say, well, what's that? <laughs> it's a Hebrew word that means the sons of Cain, and you, they are mentioned many times in God's word, and um, they are the sons of Cain. And Jesus identified them in St. John chapter 8, verse 44. He said, your father was the first murderer, who naturally being Cain. I'm out of time again. Go to your Strong's Concordance and it'll tell you. Being out of time, I love you because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in more depth. But what's most important, God loves you for it. Do you know it makes his day? It does. For you to absorb the Word that he's sent to you. And uh, that's what's important. He loves you when you love him. He loves you anyway, but maybe not what you're doing. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Bless God, he will always bless you. Most important, this. You stay in his word every day, In his word is a good day. Do you know why? Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.